There are certain games that I enjoy immensely, but never know what's the best way of doing them justice. The Guild 1 and 2 are such two games that I'm never quite sure what's the best way of tackling them. Not only are the Guild 1 and 2 underrated classics in my opinion, they are some of the hardest games to describe. From a cursory glance, they can be seen as business simulations of the late medieval period, but the game is so much more than that. And rather than spending an ungodly amount of time listing all of its features and talking about every single thing you can do, I'll tell you about Bobby Rogue and how he ended up creating a dynasty, or dynasty if you're from the UK. Shout out to all my UK fans, by the way. So when you start up the game, you can click on new game and begin your journey to cash money boy, properly. You've got quite a bit of options here when it comes to selecting your city to play in, choosing your heritage, your religion, and even your family crest. You can also choose what kind of game you want to play and the difficulty of objectives you want to reach, but I always choose free game as the guild just works better as a proper sandbox. For the city, I chose Madrid as we will have a decent amount of building slots to work with and have seven other dynasties to compete with. I also chose my starting profession to be Grave Warden, which is something I've never done prior. And once you're ready to go, the game throws you in and it's up to you on what you wanna do next. Regardless of your settings, you'll start out with the lowest level house and the lowest level for your business. As a Grave Warden, we start out with a level one graveyard, which has the benefit of not having to pay for my workers. Since necromancy is currently allowed according to the city laws, there's no risk of raising the dead to be my workers. Unfortunately, this will become a problem later on, but we will get to that part of the story later. Depending on your chosen business, we'll provide you with various ways to gain money. As a graveyard, our money comes from creating various potions and magical items, as well as renting out graves to families. The former is something we can assign workers to do, while the latter is something that'll happen over time. As we improve the building, we can get higher level graves to rent out and even unlock new activities to participate in. The economy can be a bit overwhelming at first due to the way the UI is set up, but it's pretty easy to understand once you get a handle of things. For the graveyard, we need resources to create the various magical artifacts. In order to do this, we can send workers to gather bones and skulls. For other businesses, you may need to send out a trading cart to the market to pick up the necessary supplies. Once you feel like the price and timing of the market is right, you can send your cart to the market again to make that cash money boy and proceed to do whatever you want with that money. I always recommend putting it, it back into the business as it will increase the value of the building as well as increase potential profits. Your certification ultimately determines what is the highest level of building you can achieve for a given profession. Once enough time has passed, you'll be given an invitation to improve your master grade by one level, which can unlock higher level buildings. This will cost action points, which are generated each year. There are other ways to obtain AP, such as the various random events or certain upgrades you place to your residence. AP can also be used to improve your attributes with those being negotiation, combat, rhetoric, handicraft, and stealth. All have their own benefits of improving and will cost more AP to reach a higher level. Overall, a good system that works very well here. As mentioned prior, you'll also start at the lowest level title with either gentleman or gentlewoman. Once you acquire a certain amount of total assets, your rank will go up. From the lowest level, the next level is citizen with the highest rank possibly being prince or princess of the empire. That takes a crap ton of money to reach, but thankfully each level brings in new benefits such as a higher tier house you are permitted to live in and benefits to the political sphere of influence. Politics is its own system here, so we'll get into that a bit later. After every year, you're brought into the summary screen dealing any profits or losses and where your expenditures have gone to. If you've made any sort of gain from selling goods or from an inheritance, you'll end up having taxes taken from you. This is why it's best to always make sure you have a healthy reserve of cash after making a huge profit. If you've enabled history mode, you'll also get a summary of what happened within your city during that year, as well as notable events across Europe. Seeing the historical facts is a nice little addition, but nothing that affects the overall gameplay. So making money and living the Western dream is all well and good, but we need to ensure the dynasty continues. If you're single, you can pick a spouse to court and eventually marry. My recommendation would be to look for someone older and with money as you can get a huge inheritance once they pass away. This is easily seen by right clicking your potential partners to see their total assets. Be warned though, as your partner can always leave during the courting process and end up somewhere else. Thankfully, we did end up married after several years of courting and even births 
several children. One of them will be the next character that we will take control of once Bobby Rogue passes away. Once they're old enough, they can receive occupational training as well as join a college to further their attributes. All good stuff here, but definitely was expanded upon in the second game. So life was overall good until the expected happened much earlier than expected. Necromancy is now forbidden, meaning there is no way for me to continue creating workers and sustaining my semi-honest business. Instead, I decided to switch professions to become a traveling entertainer and sell my graveyard. Unfortunately, I didn't have enough cash on hand to pull this off, so I had to borrow money from a lender. I ended up in debt for quite a few years after and money was taken from me every year, but eventually I was able to pay back all my debts with a bit of luck on my end. So as I mentioned, I have no plans in talking about every business that a player can own as that'll take up way too much time, but I can highlight some key differences for running a band of entertainers. As expected, we are all human here, so the expected change will be that we need to give them a decent wage. To keep them happy, I can boost their salary or give them bonuses every once in a while. In terms of how much money we make, we only have two ways to begin with. We can make some spiritual and ritualistic items similar to before, but we can also send the workers to beg and plead for some money. If we level up the place further, we can even host plays and generate a ton of money at once. These differences for each business is honestly why I like the guild so damn much. You never know what each career path can lead to. As expected, my wife eventually passed away, being the older lady that she was, so I gained a couple of businesses under her. These were both max level clothing stores that were already well staffed and provided a great return of investment. Because I don't have the necessary certifications to run either business, I need to hire a master to run the business for me. I can set the level of budget per year and choose what it can and can't do. This includes hiring staff, making improvements to buildings, and several more options. This is a great and necessary way to lower the amount of micromanaging you'll need to do as you can spend time focusing on the things that matter to you. Unfortunately, we started to run into some bandits as our businesses continued to expand. This required us to pay for armored escorts as we traveled to and from the market. Despite this, our carts were continuously attacked, meaning it was time for some good old combat. Unfortunately, the real-time combat in this game flat out sucks. For some reason, you can only view the action from certain fixed angles, and the combat is overall very clunky. Units often get stuck and have terrible pathfinding, as well as the commands not being followed as expected. The second game has better combat, but I wouldn't call that good either. We'll talk about that though one of these days. And what is all our ultimate fate in this world has finally happened to Bobby Rogue. I can't do it justice, so I'll just let the game narrate it. The time has come. The door opens with a creak. You have seen much in your life, and now you see your last resting place. In your dreams, you step ever closer. The flowers are exquisite. You are dead. So now that the family business is transferred all to his son, Ralph Rogue, who will follow his father's footsteps by marrying a rich woman and continuing to gain nobility and cash money boy, he eventually did something that he could never do and that is actually secure a position in politics. Honestly, it's really hard to secure a political position as you'll need to make sure the person who can choose you actually likes you. Once you're in office, you can get a yearly stipend and can apply to higher positions. Higher positions will allow you to perform various unique actions and even change the laws to your likings. So if you plan to make necromancy legal again or lower the tax rate, this is the route you want to take. My biggest issue though is just how hard it is to get your political career started and how quickly many would want to have you removed from office just because they don't like you. I guess this is just like real life, so I shouldn't complain about it. Eventually, this town will get pretty busy with so many people and buildings populating the area. And this is honestly when the game begins to go downhill for me. Since each town is only given a limited amount of building slots, you'll run into an issue where you'll need to buy a building that is already built. The problem is buildings rarely go on sale unless the owner dies and you can swoop in. The other way is to offer a bid to have the owner accept, 
but they almost never do unless you overbid like mad paying 30 grand for a building worth only 15. I will say though, this is pretty accurate to the current housing situation today, really a game far ahead of its time. But still, there's just so much crap to do that it's hard to walk away from this game as you'll want to play for one more year just like many 4x games. You can mess with your rivals, make valuable allies, participate in duels, and even use a freaking cannon to shoot at other buildings. Why the hell you can do this? I have no idea but it's fun as hell regardless. It's a great way to ruin someone's livelihood with a triple cannon shot aimed directly at their house. Now, if only this game had the ability to shoot people in a first person perspective, a la Unreal Tournament, it'll be the greatest game of all time and in the Hall of Fame easily. While the graphics are nothing to look at, the music is on a completely different level entirely. So many memorable tracks that are just perfect for a game like this. Composed by Gerhard Ottmer, Christopher Eisman, and Lars Martinson, these three did a great job overall. The soundtrack blends medieval melodies with orchestral arrangements to create a captivating atmosphere. Whether you're managing trade routes, engaging in political intrigue, or embarking on a quest for power, the music seamlessly enhances every aspect of the gameplay. From the bustling streets of a medieval city to the grand halls of a noble estate, the soundtrack immerses players in the rich tapestry of the Renaissance era Europe, making the guild not just a game, but a musical journey throughout history. Honestly, I can go on and on about other activities you can pursue like playing cards with your friends, hiring alchemists to make unique potions, taking people to court, but I think it's about time to wrap it up. What a game and what a freaking experience. Even now after playing it for decades, I still find new avenues and ways to play. I had this one playthrough where I started out as a robber, but ended up controlling all the guard houses and the criminal hideouts. It was pretty epic as I essentially controlled both the police and criminals. It's pretty wild the scenarios you can end up in, but there are some issues I do have. The combat is terrible, and if you decide to pick a certain combat heavy professions, you can expect a lot out of it. The political system can also be a bit tedious as the AI tends to just ban everything Thing and limits a lot what you can do if you don't want to get into serious trouble. Still, I gotta say this is an amazing experience and I'm glad that I was finally able to talk about it. Look forward to the Guild 2 review and when that'll happen, I have no idea, but stay tuned. Thank you guys for watching as always, and this is Powerhouse, signing off.